Yeah, the thing I like about Tozer is that he lives in my generation, more or less. You know, he's a little before me, but he saw what was coming, and he <laughs> he didn't just address it. He hit the hammer on the nail and just spoke directly to issues that have come to pass, even as he said they would. So reading Tozer sometimes is like just amazing to me. It's like as though Jesus were sitting here as he is, as though he were commenting on the state of affairs as the body of Christ, and as we look at it from his point of view, sitting in heaven, walking amidst the seven candelabra, candelabras, the seven menorahs that are in heaven, and each one representing the church, and each one of the seven being seven different types of the church as it exists today, as it existed in the past, and as it will exist in the future. And then addressing each one with particular criteria and circumstance that he sees in each one and speaks to the people that are in it. He doesn't speak to the church, he speaks to the people. And he says to those that overcome, and to some he blesses, he causes rewards to be made known of what they have done faithfully, as well as criteria that he has said that they need to change. But in it, the interesting thing about that is that even in speaking to each one, he didn't condemn any of them. He didn't throw them aside. He was still there, correcting, changing, because he is the head of the church, the body of Christ. In Tozer, many practice fraud upon their own souls. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1.8 it's funny because that's the one scripture that I tell people consistently, look, you know, you can you can put on spiritual errors, you can act like you're somebody special, you can put a doctor in front of your name, you can put a lawyer in front of your name, you can put a sir, apostle, prophet, teacher, pastor, lawyer, whatever, Indian chief, <laughs> you name it. But the fact is, you're a sinner. And I don't see anyone standing up and saying, let me put sinner in front of my name. Because... The humble and the poor know they're a sinner, and they need mercy. Everyone else seems to go off on a tangent by stating, well, it's taken care of for us, so we just go on with what we're doing. But when we deceive ourselves, that's when we get into a place where we think that because Jesus died for our sins, we don't sin, or we don't need to confess our sins, or to recognize the consequence of what happens when we do sin. And for me, that attitude causes me daily to seek his mercy and forgiveness by night as I have walked through the day committing it to him from the morning so that in between times I know that I have in some way failed to be perfect example of Jesus in my day. Because if you're perfect, praise the Lord, then you have no sin. But then you wouldn't be living here either. <laughs> of all forms of deception, self-deception is the most deadly. <clears throat> of all deceived persons, the self-deceived are the least likely to discover the fraud. The reason for this is simple. When a man is deceived by another, he is deceived against his will. He is contending against an adversary and is temporarily the victim of the other's guile. Since he expects his foe to take advantage of him, he is watchful and quick to expect trickery. When the self-deceived, it is quite different. He is his own worst enemy and is working a fraud upon himself. He wants to believe the lie and is psychologically conditioned to do so. He chooses to believe it because he wants to believe it. He does not resist the deceit but collaborates with it himself. He participates by offering little excuses along the way. There is no struggle because the victim surrenders before the fight begins. He joins in. He enjoys being deceived. It is altogether possible to practice fraud upon your own souls and go deceived to judgment. The farther we push into the sanctuary, the greater becomes the danger of self-deception. The deeply religious man is far more vulnerable than the easygoing fellow who takes his religion lightly. <clears throat> Before a man's heart has been wholly conquered by the Spirit of God, 
he may be driven to try every dodge, every sidestep to save face and protect himself from the fact of a perverse semblance of his old independence. This is always dangerous and it persisted, it may prove calamitous and disastrous for the person who participates in it. Because the reality is, is that unless we apply it to ourselves first, we'll never apply it to another. Unless we say that we are the one who is guilty, we have no business speaking to others to assume or presume that they are. Daniel was righteous and he said, I have sinned and identified it as himself and then said, we have sinned and identified himself with his people. He did not claim to be above the sins of the people, but was of the same, we used to say cut and cloth. He was of the same nature. He was of the same heart. He was of the same people. So too are you and I. The more that we walk with God, like Paul said, we should come to more of a place not of just accepting our forgiveness and our righteousness, but rather a place of crying out more adamantly for mercy and grace, as Paul said, that I, who am the chiefest of sinners, have more need of grace than they who are of lesser, that seemingly don't do as much or may not have accomplished. For Paul recognized that when you approach the holiness of God, you don't come boldly because of grace only, but you recognize that there is something that grace cannot accomplish in you, that John himself, knowing full well what grace is, John the Beloved, in heaven, fell on his face in the holiness of God. There is a place where we need to recognize that we are of unclean lips, and we are undone when we are in the presence of God Almighty. And irregardless of the fact of grace, it takes God himself face to face to lift us up off of our face and off of our knees when we come into that pureness of who he really is. If we don't feel that way and we have come too much so into that intimacy that we think that we've got it all and we are all, then we've deceived ourselves because we haven't come to a place of knowing God is holy, we are not. Irregardless of what Jesus did, there is still a place that God is holy and we are not. And we need Him to bring us farther in to Him. And for Him to say to us that He washes us clean as white as snow. For even as John had already been forgiven, the angel took the censer and touched John's lips. We too sometimes still need to be cleansed even though we're forgiven. We need to be brought to a completeness that we have yet to see, that we have not attained. And only Jesus himself can do that as our high priest. So, how do we not be deceived? We read the word. We ask God to show us. We ask Jesus himself as he sits here with us to speak directly to us and tell us what we need to hear today, to be right with him now, to be complete with him as we are, the way we are, so that he could change us and move us forward so that tomorrow we're better than what we were today.